So, um, hello, we're here today with uh, one of our keynote speakers at OHBM, Bill Seeley. Uh, and what we're doing is finding out a bit more about Bill's uh, work to, to follow up his, uh, his lecture today. So, Bill, what draws you to OHBM and how does it differ from other similar large conferences? Well, uh, I've been coming to HBM for about 10 years and I think I keep coming back because of the enthusiasm of the membership uh, for this field. Um, it feels like a cohesive group of people. They each bring a different perspective and a different set of tools. And it's also a great place to learn about new tools. So the very front line of the methodological advances in brain imaging are, are reported here first. So that's always making uh, the meeting exciting. Yeah. Fantastic. In your talk today, um, you laid out a number of different variants of the dementias and then focused on the frontotemporal dementia and they're, they vary based on both behavior and symptoms and, and other things. And I was wondering if you wanted to expand on the potential of these networks and the connectivity between the networks that you talked about in terms of leading to differential diagnosis. Could you see the field getting to a point where you pop someone in the scanner in order to distinguish between different kinds of dementias? Uh, it's a great question. I think it has a two-part answer. Carry I, on. I think. Um, <laughs> Neuroimaging brain structure and brain function can help us refine our assessment of a patient's clinical syndrome. In my talk, you heard me talk about syndromic diagnoses and pathological diagnoses as distinct and separate uh, concepts. I think structural and functional imaging can help with syndrome refinement, but when it comes to the underlying uh, neuropathological cause of that syndrome, I think those strategies are going to fall just a bit short. Hmm. If you take the example that I focused on today, behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, 15 different neuropathological causes, to think that we could actually use imaging to decide which of those 15 is the cause of a patient's VBFD, I don't think it's going to turn out. I think um, more likely uh, we'll need a molecular technique, whether hmm. it's a biomarker analysis from spinal fluid uh, or molecular imaging using PET scanning to decide which of those various um, uh, underlying histopathologies is the cause, or some kind of a merger where the, um, the structural and functional imaging refines the syndrome to the point where the differential diagnosis gets shorter, mm -hmm. and then we use molecular imaging to actually nail the final diagnosis. Fantastic. Okay. And, and what would it take to get to the point where we have screening for different uh, vulnerabilities? And um, would that goal be a priority in the absence of effective neuroprotective recommendations, or, or do we have some at the moment? Well, that's already the reality in Alzheimer's dementia, because uh, there it's a common disease. You can screen the healthy older population for amyloid beta deposition using molecular imaging, and then you can uh, triage patients for experimental uh, treatment trials based on that uh, result. Um, to imagine doing that for some of the less common dementias like frontotemporal dementia is a little bit more daunting because of the lower population prevalence. FTD has a population prevalence of about 1 in 5,000 in the population over 45. So uh, it would have to be a, either a very uh, inexpensive test yeah. or a very powerful therapy that yeah. to, to justify that kind of a screening program. Now, something you didn't get a chance to talk about in your talk, and you explicitly said you didn't have the time, was the interactions of the salience network with, for example, the default mode mm -hmm. network. And in many disorders, there's this idea that the salience network, in a sense, switches the activity between the default mode and the central executive networks, for example. And that's been hypothesized to play a role in a number of certain psychiatric disorders. Mm -hmm. Do you see that playing a role in the frontotemporal dementias? That switching per se. Yeah, yeah, or, or the interplay of those, those networks. I think it's a good question. I don't think we really know the answer yet because I don't think there's been a study yet that really went straight after the switching concept. Um, from a phenomenological standpoint, the, mm -hmm. the patients are pretty poor switchers. Um, right. Sometimes they get stuck in ruts and perseverate yes. on the same mm -hmm. behavioral response over mm -hmm. and over. Uh, other times they fail to um, uh, sort of switch in other ways when switching would be helpful. Sometimes they switch too much, uh, where uh, they're distractibly uh, moving from task to task as opposed to finishing. Um, so uh, I do think um, behavioral switching is a deficit. Whether that correlates with uh, network switching uh, is an open question, and I think it'd be an important one to address at some stage. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Bill, for joining us today. It's my pleasure.